I am a flower devotee, and I'm here to talk about the visibility of women in grains today. And um, we'll touch on a lot of different invisibles within the system along the way. And I'm very excited to have Hallie Webking yeah. here, who is a grain farmer out in Wisconsin. Um, that invisible part of the state to us <laughs> northeast or of the country, the country to the northeasterners yeah. and we have an invisible woman with us Amy Good who you might have read about in the programming couldn't be with us because she had a family emergency come up but we have notes and her story to bring into the room because she had so much to share I couldn't bear to not have her um, so I am ostensibly the moderator for this, but I'm a very chatty moderator. And I am going to start by telling you that I, um, my own journey with visibility in the entire food system really began when I got a job running a farmer's market in my city of Troy, New York. And I realized I knew zilch about the work that the farmers were doing. And in fact, I had grown up in the country. I rode my bike past fields, but I didn't know what was in the fields. I just knew where the dogs were that were going to bite me. Like, that's all I knew of the country. And so that uh, I took that job almost 20 years ago. So for the last 20 years, I've been trying to understand how um, farmers got maligned. I grew up thinking farmers were dumb, even though the farmers were in, you know, honors math class with me. How did we as a culture divide ourselves so deeply from food production? Um, my path got a little narrower over the years. I got dedicated to flour because my husband brought me a cookie. And um, this cookie had incredible grains in it that I could really taste as loudly as the fine butter and chocolate. And I thought, how could after 40 years of obsessive home baking, I not know that I needed to do something more than buy King Arthur flour. I knew King Arthur was really good, but how come I didn't know about fresh flour? And so I followed my nose and followed a lot of leaders who are rebuilding regional grain systems and wrote a book, The New Bread Basket, which is a cookbook for regional grain revival. It has one recipe, pancakes, because that's a it's a really good thing to know how to make, and I've loved them more than anything else my whole life until I got into sourdough baking after I finished the book. But that's another story. Um, and yet it's a metaphor because sourdough teaches you that we're all in it together. Everything is in that, and our attention is in it, or it doesn't come forward. So that's... Um, I imagine you were all in breakfast where Leah gave her great invocation. Um, it's been another uh, gobsmacking revelation to me this year. Her book, Farming While Black and the Cooking Gene uh, by Michael Twitty, where he really names um, all parts of the slave trade and makes visible this history that is buried. Um, those two books have been the great gift to me in trying to uh, continue my understanding of the invisible ways that we get to eat. Uh, I highly recommend both of them. And um, we're going to focus specifically on women and grains today. Grains are, um, the work is, is very hidden in general. It's easy to get enthusiastic about our farmer at the farmer's market or our brewer or whoever last touched our food, you know, the baker, the chef. We really can embrace all of that. But it's hard to go even one step backwards, let alone two step backwards, to in, in these foods that require a lot of intermediate handling facilities, um, intermediate handling to get to us. So grains need milling or malting to become bread or beverages. Um, they require such a phenomenal amount of work in between. I'm 
just really in awe of it. And I'm so excited to see that this movement is growing up a little bit. When I met Hallie and John, I was like, yes, this is, this is the definition of something coming, going from a trend to a success. When people are choosing to make their life work in non-commodity grain projects, that's when I know that this thing is going to last mm -hmm. and that we're around here. Um, so that said, uh, that's my basic intro. And I want to invite Hallie to give her basic intro and talk about how you, you came to this um, and describe where this is. Yeah. Um. So I'll say where this is now. So my husband and I, uh, we are in Wisconsin, in southwest Wisconsin. We farm 700 acres of certified organic land. Um, we work for um, our mentor. His name is Paul Bickford. He owns the land. He, we are not related to him. Um, but we have a plan to take over his farm um, plan, loosely. But a commitment, for sure. Um, and we've been working with him for three and a half years. Um, when we came to work with Paul, well, I was eight and a half months pregnant with our first child. Um, and we had moved to Wisconsin about a year and a half before that from Brooklyn. Um, my husband and I met cooking at Prune in New York. And in conversations about whether we were gonna stay in the restaurant world and stay in New York, um, he told me that he had always wanted to go home to his family's farm in, in Southwest Wisconsin and that he didn't think anyone would ever go with him. And I was like, let's go, that sounds great. Um, that's like the, the short story. I mean, the, the longer one is that I had encountered farming in different ways. Um, when I was in college and after college and didn't really have a way to enter into it. I, um, it was something that was very attractive to me, and, uh, but I didn't feel like I knew how to get started or anybody to support me in that journey. So it was really kind of amazing that I met this person in New York City who um, we could start our journey together. Um, and he really, it provided me an opportunity into, into, to start farming. Um, and when we moved to Wisconsin, we were running a breakfast and lunch cafe and we were working on my husband's family farm. It became clear that that path forward wasn't going to work for us. The family wasn't interested in talking about transitioning. And so I went on Craigslist at eight months pregnant, and I had this like revelation when I was raking hay on this family farm, and being like, we moved here to farm. I don't want to do this half time. I don't want to run a restaurant and raise my kid and work on the weekends at the farm. Like That's not the life that I envisioned. So I went on Craigslist. I typed in organic to the Madison area, and all of these like vegetable CSA, you know, pick weeds on our CSA farm came up, and that's also not what we had envisioned. Um, and then there was this one post that was from Paul, and he said that he's a 60-something-year-old farmer. He has this all of this knowledge. He wanted to pass it on, and um, he had 700 acres of organic grain. And for some reason, we were not intimidated by that, or we wanted it enough to say yes. So we met Paul, and really the first driving around his farm, I so clearly remember him saying, like, if you come to work here, I expect you to point out what we're doing wrong, like how we could be better and wh where we can make money and, like, not your typical 60-year-old idea, you know, 60-year-old farmer, or the idea of them, I guess. Um, and so my husband started working a couple weeks before my, our son was born, and it's been a long journey, but it's also crazy to feel like it's only been three and a half years because we've done so much. Um, when we started working on his farm, he had transitioned it first from in the 80s a confinement dairy to a grass-based dairy. He was milking 700 cows on pasture, which is nuts if you knew anything about that. Um, 
And then he ended up having to sell his cows and transitioned it to an organic grain farm. So he's growing alfalfa, corn, soybeans, providing, we have a lot of small organic dairies around us, fortunately. Wisconsin has a diversified agricultural landscape. Um, and when we came to work for him, we brought the idea of um, growing small grains for food. So because we came from this restaurant background, we were really interested in growing food. We didn't really want to grow vegetables on a large scale um, or even on a small scale other than to feed ourselves. But uh, we had, we knew that we could at least try to grow small grains for milling. And fortunately, there is a local stone mill that's 35 miles from us. So even when we had our cafe back in Lancaster, we were using flour from them. Um, and so we knew that there were other farmers in the area who were able to grow food grade wheat, um, which is, I don't know, once, um, once farmers started growing wheat in, you know, monocultures in Montana, um, it became less popular or less common for farmers east of the Mississippi to grow small grains. So we face a lot of the same challenges in the Midwest as they do in the Northeast, or we do in the Northeast, um, with more rainfall and similar issues. But our farm is in the Driftless region of Wisconsin, so it's an unglaciated part of the Midwest, so it's very hilly. We also have very uh, shallow topsoil, so we really have to be conservation farmers. Um, because we don't have like the feet of black soil that central Illinois has. <laughs> we don't have the luxury of that. Um, so small grains for us is a really critical part of our rotation to ensure that we are having good, you know, being good farmers, that we're taking care of our land. Um, because especially in an organic system, we have to have that like no-till, low-till uh, mentality all the time. Great. <laughs> That's a great basic starter. Let's go backwards to your personal um, quest toward farming. Because yeah. you had a couple of careers before even the restaurant, yeah. right? Yeah. So t tell me about that revelation so we can map the way that How you got, got to grains. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. I went to Connecticut College and I got a degree in modern dance. And after a few years of pursuing that, I realized that I was really looking for something that um, connected to more people. Like, not that many people care about modern dance. <laughs> not to say that it's not important, but for me, I felt like I needed something that, um, where I could. I don't know, have a greater impact or just connect to more people. Um, and I ended up um, back in Austin, which is where my mom was living and where I went to high school. And I went to, I decided to go to culinary school because I cared a lot about food. I felt like food was obviously more relevant than modern dance to everyone. Everyone has to eat. Um, and so I got a, certificate from the Le Cordon Bleu School in Austin, and I went back to New York and did my internship or my externship there. Um, and then that's when I started to work at Prune. And Prune is a great restaurant. I love it. It was very important to me, but it's also not a farm-to-table restaurant. There were a couple farmers that we worked with, but it was really like going to the farmer's markets in Union Square and seeing the grain table um, there and really starting to connect with the farmers. Um, that was like one example of how I was drawn to food production. But I also there was also a moment where I visited a friend from college and she was working on a farm in Western Massachusetts and I was like, oh my God, this is what I wanna do. And my boyfriend at the time was like mortified he was like, I could see in his eyes, he was like, oh, God, no, like, never, I will never do this. And he, and that was right, but I didn't, like, have the sense or know in that moment that, like, uh, that was my path. Um, and I can look back on it and be like, oh, yeah, 
if, if he had said yes, I'd probably be like farming in Western Massachusetts growing vegetables because it was like an opportunity that was there. I'm glad that that's not how it happened. <laughs> but it was just an interesting to look back and be like, oh yeah, that moment where I like knew. So then, um, you know, having access to the great farmers markets in New York and then having, you know, meeting this person and deciding to like build a life together and having the opportunity to go back to his family's farm um, was really like it for me. And I will say that when I moved back to Wisconsin, I remember seeing a book that said like, um, is there a moral obligation to save the family farm? And I think when I moved there was definitely like, yes, yes, we have to save this land that my husband's family has been on for 100 years. And now it's like, no, you don't. Because for us, we have such, such a better opportunity in so many ways to work with a non-family farmer. Um, and we also have many more acres. We have a bigger impact. And we have an opportunity to rent more land or buy more land um, where we are now. So we really, I would say, we changed our minds, or I changed my mind in particular, about whether that was vital or not. But. Well, I would argue that even though you're not doing a, a bloodline family farm. We are saving someone's family farm. You're, you're <laughs> saving a, a, uh, an operation that's definitely yeah. individual. Yeah. Um, and that's super important. Um, so the, uh, how about you tell us a little bit about the potential within large-scale farming to be revolutionary? Yeah. And how very extraordinary what you're doing is in Wisconsin and in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, so, interestingly, our farm is, it was easy to start farming, or to start growing small grains. Like, we have the grain drill. My, we had a swather, we have a combine, like we have the big equipment that it takes. So to add small grains into our rotation takes like intention and a little uh, bravery um, and also the support of the infrastructure for it that exists in our local grain economy um, or grain network because we do have a mill and we also have other avenues for selling um, food grade small grains and then also if our grain doesn't make spec we have lots of options to sell it as feed fortunately. Um, but for us I think we are trying to do it for ourselves obviously but also as an example of how other large-scale farmers can incorporate food grade small grains and we're trying to be able to support that in different ways. Um, we're specifically building out a grain cleaning facility. So we have a dehuller, we have a grain cleaner that basically gets them, gets our berries to a place where we feel like they can be in a bulk bin, right? So like not no chaff, no weed seed, like as clean as you can be. Um, and that also enables, like we can sell directly to millers or small bakers who are milling themselves or people who want to make berry salads or whatever. Um, but our, in our journey, we, you know, we wanted to grow food. Um, and we also realized that there was this, this hole in our system um, because you know, it's not, it's not that hard to start growing small grains. It's hard to clean them. It's hard to store them. It's hard to um, process them and get them to market. Um, it takes a lot of steps along the way. So we've built out grain bins on our farm way over capacity for us so that we can store other farmers' grain. Um, we have small... Uh, smaller bins and larger bins, smaller bins to do identity preserved. So if somebody grows a heritage variety or whatever, we can make sure that it uh, is identity preserved. If we end up um, needing to fill a big order for somebody, we can com mix grain and store it in a bin and uh, be able to sell it together. I mean, the end goal is really cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that's interesting about grains in general is grain growing and, and processing, like, 
requires cooperation. You have to work together. Like we cannot do this all on our own. We're trying to do a lot because we're like crazy young farmers, but we need we need so so many other people in our community to support us. Um, and those are other farmers. Those are millers. Those are bakers. Those are consumers. Um, but I think the impact that large farmers, large farms can have is if they focus on feeding people in their region, you can do it with not a lot of uh, extra investment. And so I think that it can be, we're hoping that it becomes a, an attractive thing for these farmers to do because it really is a conservation practice. Um, that's how we see it. And so if more farmers can add small grains into their rotation, and ta it takes a year or a year and a half or two years out of the tillage cycle, um, it can have a huge impact. Yeah, so a lot of what you're doing is modeling that there is a different way to proceed yeah. and to show how um, doing something outside of the commodity grid, um, you would think that you know, farmers who grow organic corn, soy would be ideally situated to just hop into this sudden market interest. You know, every edible magazine or local food publication, they eat your local grains, eat your local <laughs> grains. Well, how come there aren't local grains everywhere? Because it's, it's an awful lot of work. And it's not just the, um, like Hallie said, it's relatively easy to plant and harvest. But it stops being easy after that. Point. Yeah, and it stops being easy at like at harvest, like hitting the yeah. harvest targets in a climate that you've got some smiles, right? <laughs> <laughs> Growing grains in the Northeast, you know, we have to face corn is our is the native grain to America's. Right, and um, I remember learning that and feeling like, oh my God, and I like wheat. What a, isn't that something? Um, I felt very un, un American or whatever. And, uh, but you know, wheat is a desert crop. It likes a dry season to mature in. And you really have to be finicky with it to try to get stuff. It's not to say that it's impossible before the Erie Canal, we grew grains in the Northeast, mm -hmm. a lot of them, because people really like to eat bread. Yeah. In, in other times, there, you know, it was, and in other places currently, bread is still 70% of people's calories. So this is, you know, not to say vegetables are not real food, um, but, but it's, a staple. it's a staple crop. And it's, it's really important, I think, to have demonstrations of how this change can happen. Because farmers can change every season, right? You get, you, but to change a whole marketing system and go out of the standard commodity grid is really challenging. And I think it's, it's you have field days mm -hmm. at your farm. Talk a little bit about what that's like. Yeah. Um, so there is a lot of interest in our area to grow small grains. So we had a field day two summers ago. You can't do it every summer because it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, but we uh, had 120 people come to our farm and see what what we're doing. So um, they got to see, at that point, we, I think we were having like concrete pour to put some of our grain bins on. Um, and you can see our crazy, like, the way that we've rigged some of our swathing operations and things like that. Um, but I think uh, what, I think one of the takeaways that people learn from is that basically like we're we are being we are trying to set ourselves up to support other farmers um, it's not just about us we can't do it ourselves like even our grain bin construction the USDA if you are interested in growing grains there are cost share programs to build your own to build a grain bin, right? But you can't get that USDA funding if you're going to make money off of it. So 
we didn't we didn't apply for that program because our goal is to rent out grain grain bin space, and we already have it in this year. We built them last year, and we have done that for two farmers. Two farmers isn't that many, but it's two farmers whose crop we've saved, basically, um, either from custom drying uh, and storing, or drying and then finding a market for and selling. So um, I don't know. I think like. Everybody doesn't have to go as crazy as we are and put up 10 grain bins, but you have to be connected to each other. And you have to know that like people can call us and say, hey, I have this crop that came off late or got rained on. Are you able to dry it for us? Blah, blah, blah. And like we probably inconvenience ourselves in order to do that for our neighbors, but that's a critical part of what we're doing. Do you charge them rent for doing that for space? Like this? Yeah. I mean, it ends up being pennies, really. Um, you know, I, I can't remember exactly what our rate is, but we would charge for that because it is a service. But we're not trying to fleece them, obviously. Like, we want everybody to be able to make a profit on their, um, on their crop. But it is a service and an investment for us that we need to make a return on or our <laughs> bank will stop giving us money. <clears throat> yeah, and this infrastructure storage is really very important as people are trying to rebuild regional grain systems. Storage turns out to be such a big part because um, think about your end users. The, how many bakeries have silos? You know, the ones that are in the suburbs are, um, you know, in, in industrial areas, you might see a silo because they're, they're running at such a big scale. But... The burden is on the growers now. The burden to do something different and hold the crop and make change is really there. Um, which brings us to a little uh, agenda point about the importance of supporting these burgeoning things, burgeoning uh, regional grain systems. Everything is, uh, so how much do you, does any, how many people buy flour? <laughs> and do you buy organic flour? Right. And okay. so you're paying a dollar, dollar fifty a pound ish, something like that. And then, how much do you sell your flour? Um, so out of a, hmm, a cup, there are many ways that we sell our flour. Right. Um, I think. Out of a bulk bin, it's probably around that a dollar fifty, somewhere between a dollar and twenty, a dollar fifty mark. Um, bulk bin in like a co-op yeah, setting, yeah, not the bins not on their we, farm. Yeah, that's not, <laughs> and that's obviously not what we get paid per pound. Um, in a farmers market setting, we sell between two fifty and four dollars a pound, depending on what we are selling. And obviously, you don't we don't move a ton of volume in that way. Um, but it is an important sale, and it's also an important connection to make to individual consumers. And um, I bring this up because it's, I mean, the, the, that's a big jump, right? But the hope is that with, um, you know, you're really functioning as a demonstration farm, like how this stuff can go forward then the scalability is going to be, the scalability is not necessarily like um, your farm going to 2,200 2, acres. Right. The scalability is a lot of people saying, hey, I can do this too. You've got m maybe some more of the organic dairy growers in Wisconsin will see that I don't have to just provide feed grade stuff without too much extra work, they've got storage down the road, we can hop into this market opportunity and become more viable. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that commodity is completely, <laughs> it, was, it was looking bad, but it's looking worse these days. Commodity grain system, I don't know, um, uh, I don't know how it's gonna go forward. Um, I think that, yeah, I think um, like, we're in a moment in agriculture where we can't keep doing what we have been doing for many reasons, for like the health of our planet, for the health of our people, and for like uh, farming as, as a practice or as a career. 
So this is why I think, like I'm a first generation farmer, my husband is not, but um, I think that young farmers can bring new ideas and we need new ideas. We need to be able to think about value added, we need to be think thinking about diversification, um, and we can't exist within the framework. Uh, we, we're, we're dying that way, so. Yeah, it's built in too much invisibility. We can't appreciate the labor costs. Um, and there's a lot of vilification of large farms. Um, yeah, I mean, we're like almost embarrassed to say like, oh, we farm 700 acres. <laughs> um, because it's not what we, it's not, and it's also like not what we imagined. Like it, we thought maybe 120 was the size of my husband's family farm. Um, but as you, as we've done this, we realize like, we can have a bit, we can have a greater impact. Obviously, just the numbers are larger. Um, but there's also land that we can absorb and there's a certain scale for us too. We can take on another 300 acres and uh, not have to change much about how we operate. Um, yeah, I mean, grains are a low value, high volume, equipment hungry crop. Yeah. Um, there's, th this is one solution. So this is one thing we wanted to talk about is the applicability of each solution. Your solution here yeah. is gonna be very different than somebody in California who's fighting land prices and water and, right. and anything else like that. Every solution, not just in grains, but every solution is situational. Um, so I think it's really important to, and this is a way to invite Amy Good into <laughs> the conversation, uh, to, as you're thinking about possibilities in grains, look at your resources because it doesn't mean you have to hop out and get 700 acres or 50 acres or 10 acres to begin grain farming. Yeah. Beginning has a lot of different shapes. And you all know in farming, it's really important to learn as much as you can before you take a dive in on the financial side anyway. But I think it's, it's um, even more critical in grains because of that equipment and high volume, low value equation that everything is functioning in. Um, so Amy Good is from Maine. There's a section of Maine called, anybody from Maine before I embarrass myself with my, okay, so this is my um, simplified understanding of Maine. Aroostook County is the Iowa of Maine. It's this giant part of Maine that's, that's up there and lots of potatoes are grown. Um, there's been a long interest uh, in converting those acres um, up, up in the county, as it's called the county, uh, to organic because they're, uh, it's flat land, great soil, but the markets there for potatoes, I, I think it's mostly frozen, or going to the frozen french fry market. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real commodity system, lots of conventional, um, people are growing oats, they're going to Canada um, and Quaker, so don't think too hard about <laughs> oats because you'll cry. So just buy, find local oats and buy them because it's a much better scenario. Um, but the, so Amy grew up on a potato farm. Then she moved, she lives her life in New York City. And as an artist, she's a visual artist, she wanted to maintain a connection to the farm. She wanted to start something. So um, she and her, she talked to her dad about converting five acres for garlic, something that she could plant and visit, you know, and not be tending to too much. So she, the, the garlic was a fun gateway crop to beginning larger conversations about, hey, can we do some organic grains? And there's, there's a tremendous stigma um, against organics within a conventional system. So having uh, model farms that can really show that it's not just 
an eyesore, not hippy dippy. That there's there's and that it pays. You know, like this is um, something that you can do is incredible. So that first conversation, first step with garlic, translated into a larger um, scale demonstration farm. So it's something that within a larger potato farm functions as a, a model within that farming community. Um, and it's a, this is a big geographic area to, to lump all together. But the, uh, so 40 acres, as many as 40 acres within that potato farm are, are done organically with grains. Amy has been um, selling them in different ways. Some of her grains went to um, uh, Valley Malt, which is the first malt house in New England, started in 2010, Western Massachusetts, real innovation um, on that part there. Andrea Stanley started her malt house when, talk about women and grains, she had a three month old and decided she wanted something else going on in her life, so she started a malt house with her husband Christian, who is a mechanical engineer. Um, but back to Amy, she really wanted to um, encourage all of you to think about this, how to piggyback onto existing operations. You know, what is around you or where is the around you that you can um, learn from farmers who are doing this different stuff? where, um, you know, she had the infrastructure support of a family farm and land. That doesn't mean any of it was easy, just talking to her father about, hey, let's try some organics, you know. I don't talk to my father about anything. Like, <laughs> like I can't imagine trying to talk about transitioning the economic way of life. That's, that's big talk. But um, she has approached it with a great fluidity and really gotten far. She uh, also represents for Maine Grains um, in New York City. Maine Grains is a mill that's a terrific example of a community mm -hmm. saying, what are our resources and how can we make a grain solution for them? Uh, Skowhegan, Maine uh, had a jail, a county jail that was up for sale and the town didn't want a mill downtown. They thought, yeah, maybe we can get a restaurant in here, you know? And um, Skowhegan is super small. So it, uh, they, the restaurant never came to be, and the, the bid for the mill kept on happening, and now there's this great mill that is a lever for growers all around Maine in, in remote um, Aroostook County, but also in the nearer part, they're, they're just above um, Portland a couple of hours. And that's, that mill is another thing that says to growers, you can, you can do, do something it. different yeah. because we are going to be your marketplace. We are going to buy what you grow. Um, I am, I, they have a conference that I want to give a plug for every year. The Kneading Conference is a really super wonderful um, community gathering to look at grain solutions and bread baking. And um, there's another one down. Ash, that's the end of July. So I'll see you there end of July. In uh, middle of April, I'll see you in Asheville. Asheville Bread Festival is another really heavy duty, um, let's figure out grains and baking. I've never seen more bakers per square mile than in North Carolina, <laughs> that, and people ready to buy that bread, and there's a fabulous female miller. There, this is another place for women in grains, is um, small-scale milling doesn't really exist. You know, uh, there's, there's not a educational, I'm trying, am I backing out? So there's, now there's educational opportunities for malting because you can make more beer money than bread money. So there's educational opportunities in malting that there are not in milling or baking. Not, yeah, not, not, not traditional uh, learning opportunities. Yeah, in the craft sector. Yeah. 
Um, so that's an indication. And a lot of the women, a lot of the people who are innovating grains are women. Hayden Flour Mills mm -hmm. in Arizona. That's Emma Zimmerman, um, another so young mama. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Kristen Toll in uh, Los Angeles, Pasadena actually. That's Nan Kohler reinventing. Very whole grain, very incredible. Um, Amber Lamke is the one who got that mill going in Maine. And back to North Carolina, Jen Lapidus is a baker turned miller for Carolina Ground and just a ton of energy. They work really closely with North Carolina State on um, wheat crops, trying to figure out what's going to work in that region to go forward. So that's, um, that's something about the invisibility uh, piece and the work, the places where women can step in. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? Yeah, any questions now that we've given a lot of ideas? Yeah. Oh, I will repeat the question. <laughs> so we have a question about commodity systems and how they work and if commodity brokers are uh, trying to step into the demand and make mm. things happen. The example I can think of is, um, so Kansas Organic Producers, I think is the name of um, an organic cooperative that is, um, you know, the, Broker is a bad word too. Just as <laughs> acreage is, you know, we've got romanticized ideas about acreage and romanticized ideas. People will say, "Oh, I was a green broker." Yeah, you, don't you know, like you not, I mean, you, get, you can deal weed more easily these days than you can <laughs> deal grains. It's you need these intermediate people because there's so much work, farming, milling, yeah. and you know, like the whole thing is tough. So yes, Kansas organic producers. Um, they are, they have been in existence, I think, since the 80s or 90s, and they are uh, in organic commodities. So they're trying to work with and on a smaller scale with, with their growers to smell, to smell, <laughs> to sell smaller lots of, you know, a, a grower in Nebraska took, took a chance um, on, on uh, blue this, emmer. the blue emmer, the blue emmer. That, so there's like 3,200 bushels of blue emmer floating around because that's too big for even a small milling bakery to take on but too small for anything of scale that might want to, you know, hop into a, um, an ancient label thing. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I mean, there, so yeah, that's a good example. There's also a, a company called Plow, P-L-O-V-G-H, um, in our region, in Viroqua, Wisconsin, and they're really trying to connect um, buyers and farmers um, and their operate, talk about another smart woman in grains, that's Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie I can't remember her last name, but she's um, super imaginative and seeing the whole grain uh, system and seeing the necessity of a lot of hand-holding from buyers to, well, no, from farmers to buyers and yeah. trying to negotiate those relationships, not just in Wisconsin, yeah. they um, work in a lot of different places. Yeah, but there are other opportunities too. I mean, for us personally, um, Breadtopia, which sells online flour and whole grains, they buy totes from us, and that's a really helpful way to move, you know, 2,000 pounds of grain at a time because it is a high volume crop that we have to have lots of different ways to sell. And so um, having that, those allies are really critical for us too. Yeah, so that you don't have to spoon feed 
20 pound bags or 10 pound bags yeah. of whole grains out to the enthusiastic home baking community um, to have somebody who's dedicated to that yeah. is really great. Okay, okay, okay. So <laughs> the question is about um, how long does fresh flour last after milling? Um, there's a lot of information out there, and each, each person in mill will come to its own uh, comfort with that. The only time I ever had fresh flour go bad on me, and I prefer, I have a mill at home, I have a nice mock mill, but I don't like to mill it because it's another job. I want somebody else to be doing it. <laughs> so I prefer to get 25 pound sacks and keep them in my kitchen and just bake a lot. And the only time that mine went wrong was I broke my pelvis once and that kind of slowed down the baking. And I, that, I was like, wow, that's what bad flour tastes like. <laughs> but so really three to six months, it that's can what we stay. Say. Yeah. Yeah, and if you put it in the fridge or freezer, it lasts longer. Oh yeah. Like forever. Yeah. yeah. Forever, but for and grains time. will last for a really long time. Yeah, whole grains. Yeah. Like whole berries. Yeah. Other questions? And then I'll get you. That's a great question. The question is about um, other vegetable growers such as Amber Waves on Long Island, uh, which is a vegetable farm with, which rotates grains in. Uh, is there, are there other vegetable growers who are doing it at a scale that it works or grain growers who are doing vegetables at the scale that they work? Yeah. Um. <laughs> My husband and I have been talking a lot about this because like, we uh, anticipated that the audience here might be more veg growers who are interested <laughs> in integrating grains into their rotation. Um, and one example, and this isn't exactly what you're after, but one example is Andrea Hazard in Northern mm. Illinois, Hazard Free Farms. Um, she started as a veg farmer and then she her family has conventional farm in northern Illinois and so she's taken little plots and has um, grown out heritage varieties of wheat and corn. Um, those are two the two things she's really focused on in the green world um, and what I what I really appreciate about her is that she's figured out the scale like what size tractor, what size grain cleaner, what size you know and, and she also leans on her community to have somebody come combine for her or someone come swath for her or whatever. Um, so I think if you're interested in it, um, figure out where you could use a grass crop in your rotation. You know, mm -hmm. winter wheats are a cover crop. Um, and then see, figure out in, if there's someone in your community or if you, if, if you don't have an old combine, if you could get one, if you could borrow one, if someone would come do it for custom. Um, you know, there are ways to make it work without having to yourself invest in all of the equipment. But I think that's one example I can think of, of somebody who's done vegetables and grains. I've got another. Um, in my book, I got to write about Richard Giles and Michael O'Malley. So Michael, o Michael O'Malley is a, um, a bread baker who had, and, no, he's not, he's an artist who uses bread in his art a lot. And he um, did a sabbatical in the Catskills near Richard Giles of Lucky Dog Organics, which is a you know, great New York City selling 90 different vegetable crop. Um, they always wanted to do grains because Richard grew up in Alabama and Mississippi doing commodity grains and um, then you know in 
in our neighborhood, he stuck to crops and he wanted to give the attention to grains, but he didn't see how that would be possible. So the way that that was possible was the outside interest of Michael in his sabbatical year saying, I got to get to know grains. He had been a member of Richard's CSA, so he knew that um, he'd grown rye. He didn't know that Richard had a whole history and understood the crop intimately. Um, but so that's how that worked. And though that was just um, an introduction, like the relationship has not maintained, at least Michael purchased the combine and they bought a mill together. And they, so it, it took an outside interest because, you know, if you've got, you know, interplantings and, and multi 90 crops you're trying to manage, when you've got harvest time, it's 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 really hard to make it work and it you know it's such extension agents have such hope for this this is the way to go because you it is grains are not related to vegetables so it really is a great break crop and yeah. helps and make you, things you know, happen you put it in the ground and you leave it aside like if you do if you if you plant hard red winter wheat in the fall you can frost seed red clover under in february or march or whatever then when you harvest your wheat you have a clover crop and you can till that under or you know whatever you do with your clover feed the bees i had a question over here i'll get back to you hi hey, I'm just do we? Yeah. Do they get federal or state subsidies? That's the question. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, there is like a standard crop subsidy as we we grow alfalfa, corn, and soybeans as well. Um, we also get a cost share for planting cover crops. Um, an NRCS agent comes out and sees our rye, and they write us a check based on the acreage. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that we do. Um, there are other ways, like my husband and I have a small herd, small 60 head herd of grass fed beef, um, and we do cost share for water lines and things like that. Um, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, seeking out, especially those conservation programs. In my opinion, it's like, it's like voting with your dollars, it's voting with your participation. Like, if the more people that say, yes, we need these programs, the easier it is to write in a report that say, this many farmers benefited from CSP or NRCS programs or EQIP programs or whatever. So for us, it's important to work closely with our NRCS office. And I mean, we're also gonna buy our 80 acres of this farmland is how we're starting our transition with an FSA loan. It's like one and a half percent interest. It's kind of hard to beat. You know, so there are those federal programs out there that can really support you. Yeah, yeah. They have supported us. Um, I like the idea of having everybody in the community work together, but I was wondering on what scale, either monetary or size, does it make sense to avoid customer and buy your own equipment? Um, so for us, so repeat the question, thank you. Um, does it make sense, when, when does it make sense to buy your own equipment or to buy together or to, or, or, or to pay for custom work? Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, there's certainly a scale that you have to figure out. Um, for us, we're obviously at a large enough scale that, so we have a, we have roughly a seven year rotation. We have 700 acres, roughly should be a hundred acres of small grains that we have. Um, so you have to think about the custom rates for your acreage. There's, I think on the USDA website, there's a very good reference for custom rates. Um, and, and the availability of those services nearby. Yeah. So, and also that also, I mean, it's again, everything depends on your yeah. situation. So if you're in, you know, an, area that's getting beat with rain, do you really want to wait for your neighbor yeah. to get done harvesting? Yeah, so it's, um, it's tricky. It's really tricky. There's, I think that the equipment that it makes more sense to look at as at sharing, okay, so it's a two-step, the way I see it is two-step solutions. Um, set yourself up 
for the beginning on whatever uh, piggybacking infrastructure you can. Like, can you work with a grower and borrow their drain grill and borrow their, borrow all the equipment that you can for planting? Get somebody, if there's a dedicated, there is a guy in New York State who is setting up custom combat. You know, they're, they're, those, those things are returning. So look very carefully and have it all thought out before you go into the ground and then be, before anything goes into the ground. You yeah. know, don't get to the end of the season and say, hey, where's this going? I got 3,200 bushels of beautiful heritage grain. Um, and then uh, the sh one place where the sharing really, really makes sense is the storage and cleaning. So having cleaning services back in communities, I think, is critical and drying and knowing what, um, what, what to test for, what are the pitfalls. So working, you know, as this stuff is, as regional grains are emerging, um, county agents, extension agents are really putting together fact sheets and budgets um, for your area. So lean on them. Mm -hmm. And if, 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 the, if your locale doesn't have those resources, there are places that are really working hard on it. And um, I have a link on my website of resources. Um, another thing that I'm putting together is a, a regional grain map with something called the Artisan Grain Collaborative in Chicago, which is really trying to burgeon, um, support the burgeoning movement. So that's another place. It's a developing map and of, of mills, bakeries, farmers, and all the extension resources that you can look to to help find your particular solutions. Yeah. Um, any other questions right now? Yeah. So I'm curious on the small grain crop. This year we actually had negative margins on uh -huh. the farm field uh -huh. and we see them as part of the healthy rotation, but also if we're losing money on planting them, how do you how do, how do justify we get it to even or how do you, is it just selling into the right markets and getting a fair price or how do you balance yeah. the two to plant them with the need to make money on them? Yeah. Um, the question is, how do you balance, well, if your small grains aren't making you money, why keep growing them? Or how do you figure out a way to make money off of them? Because they are a critical part of rotation. Um, uh, yeah, this year really sucked. It was like... We had really high protein in our wheat and really low yields. Like our spring wheat yielded as well as our turkey red. Like it, it was. It's a rough. It's a rough moment, I think, nationally. So um, that's a heritage grain, and it's expected to have a much smaller yield yeah, than like half as much. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think one resource is the Practical Farmers of Iowa. If you look at their small grains program, um, they would probably have you know, a better, I don't know, better information because part of what they're really trying to do, in addition to getting all farmers in Iowa to plant cover crops, is to get them to start planting small grains again. Oats, right? Like revolutionary. Um, but uh, you have to convince farmers that it's worth it, right? Um, and Part of it is education and figuring out how to get it to food grade so that they might be able to sell it to grain millers. Because if you can sell you know, food grade oats, it's like, I don't know exactly, but I think it's closer to 24 cents a bushel instead of like 12. I mean, it's twice as much. Um, or seven cents a bushel or whatever food grade is. So grain millers is a commodity Sorry. buyer. Yeah. So when we're thinking about smaller scale, I think car figuring out the um, direct marketing yeah. tools, um, I would take a look at the CSA grain. There's a couple of grain CSAs that um, where you're really building. And oh, this is a great model of uh, how even little grain growers get together. So. Uh, Songbird Farms mm. and Sam Mudge. What's Sam Mudge's farm? They're up in Maine. They, um, they're both grain and bean growers, 
and um, working in a nearby region, and they did independent CSAs and, and were doing farmer's market sales of their grains as well as doing a little bit into cooperatives. And after a certain point, they said, whoa, we should just be combining our CSA and doing it together. So um, they, they are a really good example of what tools and, you know, and sharing markets is another way to look at this. Okay. The, is it the Pioneer Valley um, CSA? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. It might be called the Heritage Grain CSA. That's in the Pioneer Valley. And they've been around for a long time. And so that is a great way to um, get to move a lot of crop at a, at a retail price, yeah. at much higher price. In Oregon, there's um, a couple of areas of Oregon where they do these staple crop and fall harvest uh, buy-ups mm -hmm. where they'll you know go to a school and all the growers will bring their stuff and you stock up for the winter um, I mean as a cons the consumer stock up yeah. for the winter and you empty out as a farmer and that's another way to get um, those direct mark and also um, farmers markets are are really a great way to sell things at a higher value. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a big pain, but there's, um, you're developing those connections. You're developing, uh, you know, people in the community who want to eat their food. There are, people are at farmer's markets because they understand the value of local land staying in production and eating local nutrition. Mm -hmm. So find, if you can find a way to get there, um, for that, I think, is another yeah. tool. One thing that if you're growing small grains ever, but especially on a small scale, you, you do need to have your grain tested, in mm -hmm. particular for fusarium, um, which can make people really sick. It's like, isn't that what caused the... Salem witch hunts. I think. So there's two. There's two big um, culprits. That one of them. So vomitoxin is the vomit toxin. Yeah. Mm, so nicely named. Um, and that is uh, that's separate from ergot, which is the fungus that grows on rye, which may be culpable for yeah. the. But anyway, there are things that can really make people sick, and you need to have your ergot yeah. tested. So. Um, just you know, those are those are the that. couple of things you don't need to get you know like farina graph testing and you know no. see what kind of bread performance you're going to do. But there's and there are you know as this is coming up, there's community resources that are happening that are doing it really cheap. But yeah. I mean dairy um, dairy testers will do the basic because funguses yeah. and toxins. Like Amy said this yesterday in the. Um, Grain or in the whole grain ba baking class, like you test for fusarium for feed too, you know. So yeah. there's a limit for animal consumption as well. So um, the test shouldn't be very expensive, but they are important. Very important. Yep. Hi. Yeah, do you set up contracts before planting? Or? Um, generally, no. Sorry. Do we set up contracts before planting? Um, generally, no. We're kind. Uh, we haven't actually honestly been approached by anyone to guarantee a price. Um, we might be interested in doing that, but I think we're also really interested in serving our immediate community. So uh, it's important to us that we can guarantee enough supply for the bakers who have committed themselves to us. Um, yeah, it's really interesting as um, these small grain economies are growing, you there's a lot of times it's a handshake between a maltster and a grower, um, which is a little tricky because um, how then the, the burden might be going on the back of the grower if the crop doesn't meet the spec yeah. that you need. So this goes circles back to that idea of your flower dollars are supporting far more than the specific planting and uh, the specific farm, you know, it's supporting change mm -hmm. in a much broader sense 
in that modeling that we were talking about earlier so that other farmers can see that they can make money and take a chance and go forward. Yeah. Um, and that's also a really, uh, that's where community is vital. Um, we hope to uh, get more growers, well, we really hope to start a cooperative so that um, we can hedge our bets against crop failures. We can combine crops if we need to. Um, and you also just, I mean, you just have the support of each other, which is critical in this. Yeah, and it's a, you know, it's as changes that um, are being offered to conventional growers go, I think it's a pretty reasonable one because a lot of growers are already doing a nurse crop or a crop break. Yeah. They just need to see that they can actually make money along the way by yeah. doing something different. If there's not any questions at this second, we have 10 minutes, dang. Mm -hmm. So you were saying that you wanted to do a co-op and like mingle with like growers' plots. Yeah. Um, and you Excellent question. So the question was, uh, we talk about, we're, I just said that we want to start a cooperative um, and kind of the motivation behind that, uh, if it, so that we can serve more people basically. Um, and yeah, for sure. I think like um, we need to be able to sell flour by at $4 a pound in a certain way. But our goal really is to be able to provide to institutions, to hospitals, schools, um, yeah. So and to have it be affordable because everybody, the everybody has the right to health, healthy organic food, um, and that that's all about balance for us as a business. Obviously, we need to be profitable, and we also that's like at the core is to be able to have enough grain to supply our community in those like institutional situations. And these regional grain economies are leaning on each other in, in, in really funny ways. Like the, the, even the equipment, because we're talking about equipment of a certain scale. So the, the, the two CSAs that commingled in, um, in Maine that I was just talking about, they are sharing the combine that started farmer Graham Flower and Tor Oshner. Uh, his first combine made its way up to Maine. And now um, farmer Ground Flower's other processing <laughs> equipment made its way to out to Wisconsin. Yeah. And now it's going back to another grower in another part of Maine, not in the county, um, who decided to do different grain stuff. So it's just all of it. And the seeds are getting shared, too. Yeah. and. The crops, you know, like all of a sudden rye is the the thing to bake with, right? But last year was a wicked bad rye year. So areas are leaning on each other because they're looking for, you know, they're not fancy named varieties at this point. It's just, a, you know, very functional variety. But does anybody have the Danko? Mm -hmm. You know, because anywhere the region of anywhere that, that it was grown on a small scale in an organic system is going to be suitable. So there is a lot of um, the grain shed is growing with extended cooperation, with spider webbing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions as we? Hi. The question was about uh, adversities um, at, for women in grains or women in farming. Yeah. Um, personally, you know, in the Midwest, uh, 
you go to an organic grain conference and it's like 98% men and people talk to my husband, they don't talk to me. Um, and so it's like a, it's a daily, it's daily work both that I do and that my husband does to find balance um, and to feel like, I, like I'm represented in our operation. I think we feel like it's, like it's a partnership, but it's not always seen that way. Um, and so, I don't know, things that I have done is like stand up for myself, like have uncomfortable conversations um, and be annoying and put myself, like in, insert myself into a conversation. Um, but I think we were talking about this last night. This kind of farming is uh, machine intensive and like I don't, well, my husband doesn't know how to drive the combine yet either. It's our, it's our boss who does. <laughs> but like I don't drive the tractor. I'm not out there planting. We have two kids and I take care of them. I do the bookkeeping and uh, the marketing and, um, and that's often invisible work. Um, and I say, like personally, I know that I agree to this kind of, uh, ba this, I don't know, this balance of obligations or jobs because I, I would prioritize efficiency. And like if it were me out there having to learn how to do this, like we don't have enough hours in the day to do the work that we need to do. So it's easier, it's more efficient if my husband does it because he knows how to do it instead of me taking the time to learn. I, that's like, that's a sacrifice that I have made and I know that. Um, and I know that when my kids are in school, it will look different because I will make it look different because it's important to me to be able to have the same skills or not even the same, but have those skills for myself. Um, but I think a lot of women find themselves in other roles. I, I can name like two or three women who are like on the tractors, you know, and, and I think for a lot of people, they, um, that's what a farmer is. Right? Sometimes I'm like, am I even a farmer? Like, I'm not out there planting and I'm whatever. But, but I, I am. Um, we couldn't do this if I wasn't doing what I'm doing too, you know. Um, but I think that's another place where community is really important. There's a group of female farmers in southern Wisconsin. They're called the Soil Sisters. And they uh, are a, an amazing grassroots network that supports each other in many different ways and it started with potlucks and a listserv. And so people learn how to take care of sick animals. They borrow equipment from each other, et cetera. Um, and that has really helped me feel empowered and like I, like I can call myself a farmer. Um, but I don't know, I mean, it's like, it's a con it's, we're, on a, we're on a journey. This is a, I'm at a point in it and it's not perfect at all, but uh, I anticipate a more I hope for like a better balance in, you know, in a few years. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> yeah, the invisibility of everyone in the food system is really incredible, but the invisibility of women within the conventional farming, uh, who we call farmers, is really tough. There's great Midwestern organizations, the Women in Ag Network. Yeah. Um, great radio show that's name, whose name I've forgotten. Um, but it's, it's important to find your allies and to, to have people to help see your work so that you can see yourself as, as part of the system. Amy, when we were talking about that, um, she had idea, you know, She's, she's a woman who lives in New York City. It doesn't matter to the growers up in Aroostook County that she grew up on the farm. Mm. She's coming back and doing this wackadoodle organic stuff and her father would say, listen to her, this is how it's going. She would have suggestions about harvest. It wasn't listened to forever. Once it was, you know, it was like, 
it made sense, right? Because she had seen the system and how to do it. But this is a barrier as we try to work together in a very labor divided, gender divided labor world. Yeah. Sure, thanks for bringing that up. That was when I said, oh dang, I was like, I didn't get to the whole gender part of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, as we prepare to close our brief time together, uh, you all got index cards. Um, I'm a huge fan of index cards. If you didn't get an index card, Bonnie's going to bring them around now. At the beginning, we started by doing just a show of hands um, of uh, you know where you are in the grain system. And um, I'm inspired to to do, ask you guys to participate in this because I've been watching remotely what happened at the UK Grain Gathering. No, it was, I don't know what it was called, UK Grain Lab 2018. It just happened over in Nottingham and it was this phenomenal thing. And people keep posting about the connections. There were baking workshops, there were um, growing out land race populations. And um, one of the tools that I love that keeps popping up on Instagram is they keep going to a, um, a pledge board where people made promises to themselves and each other in a public way about what they were going to do to take things to the next step. So we don't have to do this in a public way. Um, I am asking you to write on your index card what's the next imaginable step you can take to go forward with grains, go forward with um, you know, supporting your regional grain system, supporting your personal regional grain dream and making more happen. And um, last but not least, seeing all the people and all the work that happens from field to eater. OK? So I'll stop talking for a minute, and you put your heads down and your pens on your paper. How can you step into the system? That's what I want to know. Do you want one that way? Yeah. I said I'd shut up, but I have a great idea. Um, there is a woman who um, I really admire. Her name is Sh Shalamis, and she lives in Chicago. And she started something called the Chicago Bread Club. She um, met some grain people when she was doing her nutrition degree, and uh, she got enchanted by the passion. So many people doing this grain stuff are, are really passionate. So she was like, wow, how can, I, how can I help make this happen? How can I help make people see more of the connections in grains and how to make this work? So she set up this structure called the Chicago Bread Club. And the last Monday of the month, they meet at a brewery in Chicago. She, the, right out, right or out of the bakery, or there's different venues, but yeah, oftentimes there's there's you know, beer involved. Oh right, and they bring people. It's on a Monday night, so home bakers can bring the loaf that they did, and industry bakers might have a Monday off, maybe, maybe, and um, bringing in people like Hallie and John to discuss their work and show all the parts of not really the grain chain, but the grain networks that make all of this stuff happen. Um, I'm stealing that idea of trying to break out of conventional language. We think of this as the grain chain, but the um, UK Grain Lab talked about grain networks. Like We really need to think about all of the people that we can rely upon as we build a new relationship to grains, um, plant breeders, uh, ag system supporters, you know, Green Market Regional Grains Project. They're, they're incredible. And they're not a link in the chain. They're part of a network. Because if it's just a chain, we might talk to each other and see each other. But if it's a network, I want another visual. Oh, did I? Where's that Mona Grain Lady circle? that I passed around. Right there. Yeah. there it is. Cool. Um, 
A woman named Mona Noble, who's the Noble Grain Network, she has a beauty. So if you look up the grainlady.com, she has illustrated this concept perfectly. So I know I asked you to listen while I was talking again. Uh, no, no, asked you to write while I was talking, but I have resources out at the grains table. Um, Shalamis is happy to help start uh, bread clubs, which are these great you know, networks to help people understand their grain systems. She has already helped talk to, I think, 10 different people, and she's only been going since August of last year. I've got a lot of energy to try to con convert your local, si your local food system, and um, Hallie does too, and I'm just so thankful that you took this time to be with us together and think about new relationships to grains. Thank you.